Hello. Welcome to Worship at Westminster. We're out on the farm again. And I've been, as you can see, doing a little weed eating here. I wanted to show you something. Oh, the mask that I had on. It says show love. I know you can see that. It's actually kind of the theme of our of our youth group, showing love. And um, our youth group's name is Show Senior Highs of Westminster. And so this reminds me of the ripple effect here. This mask is made from a handkerchief that um, the kids tie-dyed in the youth group. One of our members, Susan, took it and turned it into a mask. So now we all have masks that we can, hair, we can wear <laughs> to do things like working on this farm. And you can see we're working really hard today. The first thing we did was we had to, actually we're trying to mow grass and weeds that got to be about three feet tall. So that's been quite the job today. They're weeding to save the vegetables that are there in the garden as well. So it led me and hopefully the food that's growing here is gonna help people in our community. So it really made me think about the ripple effect um, that showing love has, that spreading God's love has. And I just think that's a really great example and great thing for us to hold with us as we continue to go through these days. It can be kind of hard. Um, I did want to thank everybody for contributing to our ministry at the church. We're able to continue our ministry thanks to you're showing up and helping with things like this and like other things that we do. But then also, <laughs> we're able to continue because of your pledges, because of your encouragement, because of your prayers. Um, even though we can't be physically together a lot of the time, I think we are together in spirit and we are surrounded by the spirit, surrounded by God's love and showing that love to others. So thanks be to God. All right, well, let's begin our worship. the day that the Lord has made. Let us 
just rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Confident in this ever-gracious, never-failing help, we come before the Lord, confessing our sin and seeking forgiveness. Gracious and holy God, we come before you to confess our sins, to acknowledge again all that separates us from you and our own best selves. Forgive us when we fail to live in your creation as upon holy ground. Forgive us for not seeing the holiness in ourselves and in those around us. Forgive us for allowing the anxieties and uncertainties of the world around us to drown out your still, small voice of peace. Forgive us for neglecting the ways of justice for our inattention to Jesus' call to faithful discipleship. In his name we pray. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would now be lost in sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side, and so we are forgiven. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Once again, we're going to return to Exodus and sort of to bring you up to date, what has happened with the Hebrew people and the Egyptians is the Hebrew people have again gone to the Pharaoh. Moses has pleaded for them to be freed. They've had the multiple plagues. And now they've had what we come to know now as the Passover. A lamb has been slaughtered. All the Hebrew homes have been marked with the blood and the angel of death passed over their homes, but not the Egyptian homes. So the Egyptian people are ready for the Hebrew people to go. They've had the plagues, they've had loss of their family, now they're ready for them to go. And they're so ready for them to go that they have given them all their jewels and their gold and their silver. The scripture says the Hebrew people have plundered Egypt. So instead of taking the most direct route to the land of milk and honey, they're sort of taking the scenic route and taking the southern route, which is, gets them towards the Red Sea. First, they have a seven day service of consecration, which is basically a long religious festival where they observe and dedicate all these new things to the Lord. So in the meantime, the Pharaoh has changed his mind. And now the entire Egyptian army with 600 chariots are chasing after the Hebrew people. And the Hebrew people are caught between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. And that's where we come to our passage today. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. So the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground and the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians and upon their chariot and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal death. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea and the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in God and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome to Time with the Children. Can you tell where we are? We're in a special place. Let me show you. Where are we, Lila? In here. We're in church. We're in here. That's right. We're at church. And we're sitting in the place where we normally do Time with the Children. So if church were back in like it used to be, you guys would all be sitting in the pews and you would come up and we'd sit and we'd learn a lesson and we'd say a prayer and we'd go downstairs. 
And I've really been missing that. I've been missing being in this room with you guys, being downstairs with you guys. And it's good for me to be back in here, so I thought it might be good for you to see it too. So I thought it'd be fun. Uh -huh. I thought it would be fun if we could video that path that you normally take where you come through the church, down the stairs, and all the way down to the children's worship room. So let's do it together, okay? Let's go. Did that bring back some memories for you guys? I love seeing Lila come down the stairs the way you guys normally do. And they're cleaning the carpets right now. That's why you saw all those hoses out there. So normally after we all come down the stairs, you would sit on the carpet and I'd sit in the chair and we'd go around in a circle. And everybody could say maybe what they had for breakfast that day or some other fun fact. And then we'd have our snack and we'd do Holy Moly where we watch the funny movie and we learn about a Bible story. Um, and even though we can't be in the church together right now, that doesn't mean that we can't learn about God. God doesn't just live in this church or in this room. I read the other day that God lives with us. He holds our hand and he lives within us in our heart. So that means that no matter where you are or where you go, God is always with you and within you. And you can talk to him and you can learn about him. And it doesn't matter where we are. And I find that really comforting. And I hope you do too. So I cannot wait for your little bodies to be back in this room. But in the meantime, know that God is still with you wherever you are. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for always being with us and within us. Amen. Bye-bye. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than other, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in the honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. But those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was bought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. And that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him by the throat. He said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison till he could pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are uh, been kind of working our way through Matthew's gospel. And uh, the subject today in the parable uh, was forgiveness. And it was, uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity that said that forgiveness is a lovely idea until something happens that you actually have to forgive. And then it becomes a bit more difficult and a bit more complicated. Um, and it is complicated. In one sense, it sounds like it shouldn't be, should it? God has forgiven us, we should forgive others. But we know that that's not how it works in, in real life sometimes. And that we bring to this idea of forgiveness so many what-if scenarios. Are we talking about <clears throat> something between longtime friends? Are we talking about some kind of abuse? Are we talking about a, a violent crime? Uh, you were cheated in a business deal? Uh, all of that? makes it different. Here we are today as we're doing this where it's the uh, the 19th, uh, well I don't like the word anniversary, the 19th remembrance of September 11th. What does forgiveness mean in that in that context? But context is important, particularly in the Gospels. In Matthew, Jesus has been talking about life in community. Uh, what do you do to that one lost sheep? Well, you try to find them and restore them back to community because that's what's important. As we talked about last week, if somebody offends you, you go to the person and you take somebody else because, and you keep going because ultimately the goal is, is reconciliation. And here, the idea of forgiveness come, you know, comes up. And it's in, it's in the context of a good, healthy relationship. You know, Peter starts out saying, if a member of the church, your community, does something, so it's assuming it's someone that you care about. and that, So that, that makes it a little bit different. And so Peter says, how often should we forgive this person? And just like last week, <clears throat> as often as it takes... You know, and some translations say, what, 70 times 7, 77, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, it's as often as it takes to restore that relationship. And so Jesus tells this parable uh, that Grady read, a long parable about a king. And he forgives one of his servants an absurd amount of money, like billions of dollars. Wipe the slate clean. And he goes out and has somebody put in prison who owes him 15 bucks or something like that. You know, it's a ridiculous scenario to say, basically, we have been forgiven so much, and yet, in practicality, we forgive others so little. And it's interesting the language that is used in this. It's not an emotional appeal, really. It's about debts and prison, as if... The inability to forgive 
It's like being in a prison that you can't get out of. John Prine, God rest his soul, has a wonderful song called Chain of Sorrow in which he says that a heart stained in anger grows weak and grows bitter. You become your own prisoner as you find yourself sit there wrapped up in a trap of your own chain of sorrow. That language that anger and bitterness and resentment can just put us in this sort of prison that we can't get out of. The author Anne Lamont has this wonderful graphic line. She says that our inability to forgive, she said it's like, quote, drinking rat poison and then waiting around for the rat to die. You know, it just, it just poisons us, that, that sort of resentment and wanting revenge. And so in that sense, maybe forgiveness, it's, the word means release. You know, what, what do I have to release? It may not have anything to do with the other person in certain situations. It's what do I need to let go of? And that's how I look at it in, in other contexts. You know, I, I had a conversation with a woman several years ago, a young lady who described a, just, just a horribly abusive situation. And she had nothing to do with, with God or religion. In fact, you know, she said to me directly, she said, you know, I remember praying. And she said, you know, her exact words, God didn't do nothing for me. So I want nothing to do with God. And I didn't have an answer that I, and I didn't try to answer that. And I still don't have a, an answer that wouldn't sound trite. I, I think sometimes there are some wounds, wounds that are so deep that forgiveness in the traditional sense, it just it may not be possible. But I still think there's a place of, of wholeness and healing there. And again, I think of, uh, of Anne's thing of not letting the rat win, so to speak, uh, so that we're not imprisoned by those, by those feelings. And each of us has to find that in your own way on an individual level. Uh, I, and we hear these stories of people who forgive these incredible things, the, the, the folks at the AME Church in Charleston who, who forgive this white supremacist guy who comes in and murders people and they find that place where they where they forgive him it's not that he doesn't pay for the consequences of his actions but uh, they found that place and I'm convinced that whatever who however you get to that place that it comes from outside us somehow and it's not stuff we generate from within that it that it comes from something outside of us and I think that's what this, this parable is getting at in, in, in Matthew's gospel, that, that forgiveness, at least for this author, is not just some horizontal transaction, that it's, it's a vertical thing. And this whole thing about you've been forgiven this much and, and you forgive so little, I think is about <clears throat> getting to that place of release is looking at other graces and blessings and gifts in our lives and letting those flow through us. And I think that's, I think that's how we get to that place if, if, if we do. And again, you know, the language of the parable is about debts and numbers and, you know, 70 times 7 and which is kind of interesting language because, you know, Peter is keeping score if you think about it, right? Because we know the numbers. We know how many times so-and-so said such and so, you know, because <clears throat> we keep score. And you don't worry about getting even unless you're keeping score. So what does it mean that God doesn't keep score? And how, how do we live our lives in such a way, how does that shape us that we don't, that we don't live keeping score in that way. And that's why I say I think forgiveness has different connotations in different contexts. Uh, again, is it somebody we love, we want to restore a relationship, or some kind of violent thing we're responding to? Uh, 
What does it look like on a larger scale? Maybe it's simply about breaking the cycle of violence. Uh, you know, nations keep score against nations. What, you know, what if reconciliation and not retaliation becomes the guiding force? Maybe forgiveness is bound up simply in a refusal to, to demonize uh, the other, whatever the other may be. One of the things I find really interesting is that when we talk of forgiveness, when we read a parable, and I hope it's not just me, when we read <clears throat> things about forgiveness, it's like we immediately go to those places where we've been wronged and that we should forgive. Rarely, I think, do we reflect on those places where we need to ask for forgiveness. And if you look at the history of the church and the history of Christianity, and if you look at, if you look at women and divorced persons and the LBGTQ community and, and on and on down the line, there are lots of places where I think Christianity has needed to ask for forgiveness, as does all religion, uh, as does humanity in a sense. And I think that's why this parable is important that it's, that it's not just the horizontal, that it's, it's, this, it's this vertical dimension to it that <clears throat> if we don't recognize that and don't recognize that about ourselves, that can also imprison us, I think. Um, the good news, of course, is that in the book of Exodus, God is a God of liberation. God is a God who <clears throat> liberates us from all these things that imprison us. Uh, the Exodus story is a faith story. I was going to say it, it's worthy of a Hollywood movie. It was worthy of a Hollywood movie. Charlton Heston, for those of you who remember that far, that far back. Uh, but it's, it's a story of God's liberation of an enslaved people. And we like to think that <clears throat> God is not partisan. But have you read the Bible? <laughs> God is very partisan. Partisan toward the poor and the oppressed, toward the widow and the orphan and the most vulnerable uh, among us. And that's why some of us get frustrated when, you know, <clears throat> the phrase black lives matter is met with, well, all lives matter. Well, that's not the point and that's a way of obscuring the point that it is where lives are hurting and suffering and oppression is happening is that God's power and spirit is working. We have a tendency to look at this story uh, and spiritualize it. You know, I've, I've heard many sermons on that. What, you know, what is, what is the Red Sea in front of you? What is that obstacle you can't cross? Well, God, just trust God and God will provide a way. And that's true, perhaps. But this is a historical account of a people who experienced God in a concrete act of liberation from slavery and as such has given hope to peoples throughout history to enslave peoples. I said a few, a couple years ago, I guess, in a sermon uh, that there are things about this story that make some of us uncomfortable. And it's natural, perhaps, but there is no note of sympathy for the Egyptians that died. And we don't do that. When the oppressor gets what's coming to them, you know, we cheer. We don't, we're not sad. There's an old Hasidic tale uh, that a rabbi told centuries ago. And it's after... Moses has parted the sea and the Israelites go through to safety and the waves come crashing down and kill all the Egyptians. And up in heaven, heaven the angels are all together and they're singing and they're playing their harps and they're celebrating. And they say, where's God? And they say, God is off somewhere. And one of the angels goes to say, why aren't you over here celebrating? By your power, your people have been delivered. But they notice that God's crying. Why? And God says, I'm crying for all the Egyptians. They were my people too. Somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's husband. And that's a, that's a hard place to get to, but it's, 
it's a necessary place, I think. Someone also said once that you cannot truly know what freedom is until you have been enslaved. And perhaps that's true as well. I think reading this story, one of the things that makes me uncomfortable reading this story as a person of privilege is that I just might be the Egyptian in this scenario. Uh, so that our freedom from that prison is working with and for and, and listening, I mean truly listening to groups and to people who are marginalized. Um, something that makes me uncomfortable about the ending of this parable is that it sounds very harsh. You know, if, if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. But over the years, I, I think I hear that more as a, if you don't, if you can't open yourself to that grace that flows through us, then it, like God can't forgive. So it's not, it's not won't, it's that, it's that it's a process of continually opening ourselves to God's grace. Uh, it's an imperfect process, it's, it's a long process. Uh, and sometimes it begins with the people closest to us. But to be people shaped by that grace as we encounter others in the world, uh, I think it takes time and prayer and, and, uh, and fortitude. And maybe one of the places where we begin is like when Paul's talking you know, to the church in Rome, and it uses that wonderful phrase. He says, we do not live to ourselves. We do not live to ourselves. And maybe that's part of that place of release, whether it's individual forgiveness or the larger issues in the world. We do not live to ourselves. We live for each other. Uh, and that's challenging. But I think, I think about that with something is. Again, we you know have politicized the, the the wearing of masks and just it seems so frustrating. We do not live to ourselves. If, if you don't do it for yourself, do it for others. You know, uh, I mean, here's Paul writing to this community that's struggling, uh, fighting over issues which he thinks are inconsequential. You know, should we eat meat which has been sacrificed? Look, people have different convictions. Don't demonize each other. You know, be tolerant of differences because God is the God of all people. And He says, whether we live or whether we die, we, are, we belong to the Lord. How do we let that shape us in the world? To shape the way we think about forgiveness. Both our need to give it and our need to receive it as well. Hallelujah and Amen. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that awaits to enslave us all, and whose love defeating deathless, holds the crosses of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of death, in God we trust. In the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love and in the company of the faithful wherever found. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we love to say, I may forgive, but I'll never forget. And we think that we are truly following the ways of Christ. 
How blind we are, O God. Forgiveness means wiping the slate clean, not retaining the hurt. It works both ways, letting ourselves make a decision for healing and reaching out to the one who has hurt us to offer forgiveness and redemption. None of us is perfect, we know that, but Jesus reminded us that love is the ruling component in lives of faithful living. Help us, O Lord, really receive the love that you have lavished upon us. Help us understand that love as an agent of forgiveness. As we remember the names of people and situations that are on our hearts, we seek your healing mercies and tender love for them. Be with those who have suffered loss. Please bring comfort to them. Be with those struggling with illness. Please send your spirit to encourage them. Be with those who are caregivers. Please send them strength and patience. Be with those who are lonely. Please nudge us to reach out to them. Be with those who are worried about their children, grandchildren, spouses, or aging parents. Please send them hope. We lift up teachers at school or at home, first responders, nurses, doctors, technicians, and everyone striving to find a cure for COVID-19. Remind us that the same mercy and love is continually offered to us. Though we may falter and fail, though we seek and strive, be with us, gracious Lord, all of our days. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.